Well, good morning, everyone. You can take out your message notes, the yellow insert bulletin. We have been following Daniel since he was about a 15-year-old teenager in chapter 1. Now, in chapter 6, he's in his 80s, probably between the ages of 82 and 86. But you know what is really interesting? God's not through with them yet. He's in his 80s and God isn't even close to being through with him yet. And the Lord isn't through with you either, even though you may consider yourself, quote marks, retired. Now, if you're one of these retired people and you have said, I'm not doing anymore, then God is through with you. And I'm through with you too. But if you're open and available, he may have a whole lot more to do. Daniel has been a political ruler in both the Babylonian and Persian empires, and he keeps getting <coughs> promoted. And so in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, Daniel's new boss, Darius the Mede, killed his old boss, Daniel's old boss, King Belshazzar. But the new boss, Dan uh, Darius, keeps Daniel. And why does Daniel keep getting promoted no matter who's king and no matter what government he is serving under? <clears throat> this guy was just loved by everybody. Well, there's at least three reasons why Daniel was a standout, and we can apply these principles to ourselves. Number one <clears throat> was a high degree of proficiency. He was highly proficient for two reasons. Number one, he was a lifelong student who always learned. He was a lifelong learner. And number two, he always practiced the principles of God's Word. You can practice the principles of God's Word, and you can pray, and you can continue to get wiser even in your 80s, folks. Amen. There is hope. <laughs> <clears throat> Daniel 6, verse 3. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators, the guys in his 80s, and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. You can say what you want about King Darius, but this guy, as an employer, does not believe in age discrimination. Now, there may be a few around, and I'm not saying there aren't any, but how many Fortune 500 companies are getting ready to elevate a person in their 80s to CEO? This guy doesn't care if he's in his 80s. He, he, he's, he's excellent in his qualities, and he recognizes them as a good guy, and he wants them over his kingdom. So he was a standout because of his proficiency. And you can thank me after the lesson that you did not have to fill in the word proficiency in the blank. <laughs> I was thinking about you and I was watching out for you. Two, he was faithful, responsible, and completely trustworthy. He was faithful, responsible, and completely trustworthy. Daniel was a man of integrity and generosity and humility and godliness and goodness and kindness and wisdom. Verse 4. Then the other administrators and princes began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling his affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So I have a question. How would you like this guy working for your business? How would you like the guy who is faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy? Well, no matter how good you are, there's always going to be a few people who don't like you for various reasons. And the truth is, 
Sometimes people just don't like standouts. They just don't like people who are exceptional in their qualities and in their abilities. And so they're going to try to get Daniel. They, you know what's interesting? Is they couldn't find anything to criticize in his handling of government affairs. Do you find that interesting? I figure if you dig deep enough, you could probably find something on just about anybody. But they couldn't find anything and how he was handling his government job. So now they're going to have to find something along somewhere else. And then number three, he was a standout because of his public commitment to God. He was a standout because of his public commitment to God. And we have seen in Daniel's life, from the time he was a teenager in chapter 1, he's been very public about his faith in God and his love for God. He hasn't backed down from it in any form or fashion at any time. Verse 5, Daniel 6, verse 5. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the requirements of his religion. We can't find anything wrong with the way that he's handling his government job, so maybe we can find something wrong with his religion. Daniel is a blueprint of the kind of leaders we want in our country. On a national level, on a state level, on a local level, and maybe even in your homeowners associations. <laughs> those homeowners associations, boy, they can have some power. They can get the whip out on you at those homeowners associations. <laughs> whip you around and make it. Why should you have to mow your yard? <laughs> Just let the whole thing go down. You know, you've got to keep it up. So in verses 6 through 9, a conspiracy is set up to trap Daniel. Can't find anything wrong in how he's handling his job. So we're going to set a trap. And we're going to catch it. So, the administrators and princes went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. Ah, they're just buttering him up. You give one of these guys a knife and they would stab it in his back if they thought they could get away with it. Long live King Darius. Give me a break. <laughs> we administrators, perfect princes, advisors, and other officials have unanimously agreed that your majesty should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days anyone who prays to anyone divine or human except to your majesty will be thrown in the lion's den. Oh, that's sweet. And let your majesty issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed. A law of the Medes and Persians which cannot be revoked in ancient history. The Medes and the Persians were known for having laws that when written a certain way, signed by the king, could not be revoked even by the king himself. Even though the king is the absolute sovereign ruler, he can't change it. They were known for the laws of the Medes and the Persians. So King Darius signed the law. He doesn't know that he's being tricked by his administrators and his advisors. I want you to think about something. These guys, get this, these guys are so desperate to get rid of Daniel that they pass a national law to hurt one guy. They want to hurt one guy, so they pass a national law to get him. Now, what are Daniel's options? Here is what has been happening. Every day, Daniel opens his windows three times a day, and he prays. You can say he's praying in public. Other people can see him. And he prays to God facing Jerusalem. So now this law has been passed that for 30 days you can only pray to the king. So here are some possible options. Number one, he could pretend to pray to the king for 30 days. He could do like this, but he really wouldn't be saying anything. It would be a fake prayer. 
He can maybe do fake prayers for 30 days. Another option, he could publicly protest. He could go around the courthouse in, uh, in Babylon, and, or in the, the Persian, the Medes, wherever they are. He could go around the courthouse with the sign saying, I protest, but then he would probably be dead in about two hours. <coughs> this is not a democracy. Another option is that he could appeal to the king privately, because the king loves Daniel. and say, King, you and I are buddies. Maybe we could just kind of work something out here. But that isn't, that's not going to happen because not even the king can revoke this law. Fourth, he could stop praying to God for 30 days, give up prayer for 30 days. Another option is he could keep praying to God, but pray in secret. Pray in secret. But if he does that, then his enemies kind of have one because they're wanting Daniel to back down from his faith. And then the next option, the last option, which is the one that he chooses, is he can keep praying in public as he has always done. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but it is when you're facing a lion's den, it's a big deal. You think this is a big deal? <laughs> That's a big deal, folks. So, in verse 10, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, so he knows about it, can only pray to the king for 30 days. He went home, watch this, and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. So Daniel doesn't change his routine. Now what is interesting is there is no command in the Old Testament for the Jews to pray three times a day. And there is no command in the Old Testament that they have to face Jerusalem when they pray. All of this is optional to begin with. This became a custom of Jewish exiles living outside of their ancestral homelands to pray three times a day facing Jerusalem. It was not required by God. But he's still going to do it. So his enemies think they have Daniel trapped, and they do, they do effectively have him trapped. So we're going to take a look at what happens. Why was Daniel courageous in spite of his fears? I mean, he had to be fearful. Why was he courageous? So we're going to look at some things. Number one is he remembered God's faithfulness in the past. One reason why he was courageous is because he remembered God's faithfulness in the past. When you're faced with a difficulty, faced with a trial, would you remember God's faithfulness in the past? He has been good to you in many ways. Daniel no doubt remembered how God had given him the ability to interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams in chapters 2 and 4. He remembered how he read the handwriting on the wall in chapter 5. He no doubt remembered how God preserved his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the midst of the fiery furnace. So he has remembered God's faithfulness. So when you get scared, remember that God is going to give you the inner strength to preserve your faith. Now he say he was going to preserve you. You may die. But if you die and you go to heaven, then God, did God preserve your faith to the end? Yes, he did. Second thing is that he prayed to God three times a day. Three times a day. Let's take a look at the principle of this. If you had a regular and routine prayer life, would that help you to be a stronger Christian? I think it would. Here's a key thought. The secret of standing strong is kneeling often. So he prayed to God three times a day. So regular and routine. Three, third day, is he knew the rewards were greater than the risk. He knew the rewards were greater than the risk. 
You may remember Peter and the apostles in Acts chapter 5 standing before the Jewish Sanhedrin court and they made that statement, hey, we must obey God rather than men. So if you struggle with the fear of disapproval, remember a couple of things. Number one, do a couple of things. Minimize the negative possibilities, even if that possibility is death. Minimize the negative possibilities. And the second thing, focus on the benefits. Now you are probably, you and I, we're probably never going to have to face a lion's den. But let's let the lion's den be a metaphor that represents life's problems. You may very well be ostracized. You may very well be gossiped about. And you may have a business that decreases because of your moral or Christian convictions as we have seen has happened with several Christian businesses in the last few years. So what are some of the benefits of doing the morally right thing? Number one, standing for God is a victory over the fear of sinful people. Standing for God is a victory over the fear of sinful people. God isn't going to let sinful people destroy your faith. He's going to give you inner strength to maintain your faith and not fear the traps and the devices of evil people. So in Hebrews 13, 6, it says, We can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, so I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Right. It was Jesus who said, do not fear the one who can destroy your physical body. You need to fear the one who can destroy both your body and soul in hell. So a couple of observations, general observations about fear. Number one, fear is uncomfortable, but it probably isn't going to kill you. You may think you're going to die. You may feel like you're going to die. You may even announce to everybody around you, say goodbye, I'm about to die. <laughs> but it's probably not going to kill you. You're familiar, I love this acronym. You're maybe familiar with the acronym F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Now I'm not su here to suggest that everything you're facing in life is false evidence and it's no big deal. But fear is not going to overcome your faith in God. Second thing is fear grows when I give into it and lessens when I move against it. And remember that Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is moving forward in spite of your fears. I love this passage in Acts 4.29. It says, And now, Lord, listen to their threats. Lord, help us, your servants, to speak your word without fear. That would be a great verse for us to remember. Just to be thinking about that during the day. Help me to speak your word, live your word without fear. So standing for God is a victory over the fear of sinful people. Number two, standing for God builds my faith. Standing for God builds my faith. This is 2 Timothy 1.8. You must never be ashamed to tell others about the Lord, our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the proclamation of the good news. Paul says, I want God to give you the strength like he has given me so you can be ready to share God's word no matter what happens. So standing for God has at least the potential to build your faith. And then three, third thing, 
Standing for God gives me an opportunity to see God's work. Standing for God gives me an opportunity to see God's work. Daniel gave God an opportunity to demonstrate his work. Now, I'm not making any kind of, of judgment. But perhaps sometimes individually and as a congregation, we don't see God's work like we would like to see it because we haven't given Him an opportunity to demonstrate. Amen. We haven't really maybe taken some risk in order to see God demonstrate His work. So in Daniel 6, verse 16, So at last, the king did not want to. The king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you worship continually, rescue you. And in the next couple of verses, the king was very sad and very depressed. He did not have his usual entertainment brought in. was not able to sleep. This guy really loved Daniel. And who wouldn't love Daniel? Daniel 6, 19. Very early the next morning, the king hurried out to the lion's den. I guess it must have been close to the palace or something. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you worship continually able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. If there ever was a sincere long live the king, here it is. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in your sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. Well, the king wasn't too happy about what happened. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children and the lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Darius loved Daniel and thought that his favorite guy in the kingdom had been eaten by lions. Well, now you may, let's use a metaphor for the lion's den again. You may be in a pit right now. I'm telling you, you have to continue to praise God in the pit. Amen. Don't give up your faith in the pit. Keep going even though you are in the pit. Do not give up. Amen. Whether He delivers you from the pit or not. Physically. So standing for God gives an opportunity to see God's work. The fourth benefit Standing for God. Standing for God encourages other believers to stand for God. Have you noticed that? Standing for God encourages other believers to stand for God. You've seen the movies like Mel Gibson, Braveheart. One guy stands up courageously and then all of a sudden everybody else just magically becomes courageous. And that's because courage is contagious. In Philippians 1.14, Paul's in prison as he writes the book of Philippians. He says, because of my imprisonment, that's how I knew he was in prison. Many of the Christians have gained confidence and become more bold in telling others about Christ. <clears throat> Same thing happens here. Your faith in times of relationship issues, health problems, employment struggles, encourages us to be bold and confident. We have members here, they've been through everything. We're talking about health problems, we're talking about divorce, we're talking about finances, but they just kept going. They never gave up their faith in the Lord. And I, I'm looking at the same. Whoa, if they can do it, I can do it too. May not be not on their level, but I'm going to hang in there the best I can and not give up. So you are a source of encouragement. We encourage one another. Number five. Standing up for God is a powerful example to non-believers. Standing up for God is a powerful example to non-believers. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 25. 
Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world, well, at least throughout the Middle East. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. Well, this guy has a pretty good concept of the kingdom. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in heavens and on earth, in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Darius is the second king. I'm talking king, not assistant king, not deputy king. He's the second king to be that he's led to the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar and now King Darius. Can you imagine this powerful king turned believer sending out this message to the Middle East? It happened. Because Daniel was willing to stand up for moral principles. Okay, now we're going to go deep. Are you ready to go deep with me? We're not going to snorkel along the surface. We're not even putting on scuba gear because that's not going to be good enough. We're going to need a diving suit. We're going to go deep. Do you believe there is a connection between Daniel and what happened 500 years later with the wise men who came to see Christ? Yeah. Matthew 2. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands, eastern land, arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen a star as it arose, and we have come to worship him. Eastern lands would be the Babylonian and Persian empires in the book of Daniel. How in the world did these people know about the coming Messiah? Why did the wise men come to see Jesus, folks? One word. Daniel. Daniel is the reason. Daniel stood up for God in a pagan culture. He prayed in the open. He did not back down. And the wise men came looking for Jesus 500 years later. That was the long-term impact of Daniel standing for the Lord. So here's what the application is, folks. You cannot measure your impact in the future. I mean, I know we do things and we like to see some immediate results, get a pat on the back and somebody a pat on your head and say, I like you. But you may be planting a seed that isn't going to sprout for a few generations and it could be your great, great grandchildren. Something happens, but it started because you planted the seed. Daniel stood for the Lord and this king sent this letter out. These people know, knew about the Jewish God and Jewish scriptures. Now 500 years later, they're coming to see the Christ child. Wasn't in the manger, of course, but he was probably somewhere between slightly less than two years old. So that brings me to my statement that I like to make to you. Are you ready to begin your legacy, your spiritual legacy? You see, we need some teachers. And I know how difficult it can be to be a teacher and you have prepared and then no children come. You've got everything prepared, no children show up. Or maybe one or two children show up. It can be disappointing. But you may be planting a seed. A seed that may sprout years on down the road. Amen. We, at this congregation, we're in the rebuilding process right now. 
And we are reaping, no doubt, we have taken some hard, tough hits. But we're going to rebuild. And we are rebuilding. And it's going to be better than ever before. And it's because of your love and your sacrifices that we are going to continue to fold, go forward. Daniel, I'm sure, had no idea that his spiritual impact would still be felt 500 years in the future. So it's a powerful example to non-believers. Then number six. Standing strong for God will be rewarded in eternity. You stand strong for the Lord. No one's asking for perfection. Just give them your heart. Be rewarded in eternity. This is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Prophets and godly people for hundreds of years since Daniel have been put down for being believers and standing firm on moral and ethical issues, but they were rewarded and you are going to be rewarded too. Listen to this, folks. Daniel is still going strong at 85, man. He's still putting it out at 85. God wasn't done with it. And we're going to get a great prayer. We're going to look at next week this, this prayer in chapter 9. God isn't through with you either. Here's, here's what happens sometimes in church. People get up around 60, 65, and they check out. They say, you know what they do? They're on the yellow card. They're looking for the box that says check out. I'm putting my name on here and I'm checking the box there. It says, uh, Bruce is checking out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And it goes something like this. Let somebody else do church because I've already done my part in church. God's still using Daniel in his 80s. I'm here to tell you. Your most influential years may be in your 70s and your 80s. That's why I haven't even hit my prime yet. I'm just coming into the prime, baby. We're just coming into the edges of that thing. And it's the same way with you. You're not coming. I get the retirement thing. But in the kingdom of God, I'm asking what does that mean to you in the kingdom? It means that you can do some things that you couldn't do before, folks. We got these talented people. You are so beautiful, talented people. It's incredible. Keep going. Remember the first couple of lessons we talked about the teenagers? Well, we're kind of coming to the end of the series talking about the people kind of at the other end of the teenagers. I'm not saying, like, you know, you've got them back one day. <laughs> Because how God used them and how God is using using you. So I'm looking forward to our future. It's going to be good. It's going to be really good because we have good people and we have people with good hearts. And we're going to keep moving forward and we're not going to give up. Don't become discouraged because you just don't see immediate results. With you. You've been handing out maybe that good news uh, booklet. You'd, you'd love to have people lining up at your door. Can I be baptized? That'd be beautiful. We may not see results immediately, folks. We can't make judgments. What we can do is we can believe the promise that says, God says, I'm going to work all things together for good. And if we don't see it now, perhaps he'll allow us to have a glimpse of it in eternity. But keep going. Do not give up. You're so beautiful and so well, enough of the adjectives, right? David is going to lead us in our invitation him. If we can assist you in some way, perhaps putting Christ on in baptism, we would, we would love to do that. If we can help you in some other way, please let us know what your need is while we stand here.